know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk exposes the Brushy Bill stories, fake Lincoln County War period, in the hoax's book, alias Billy the Kid. The information is from my book, Cracking the Billy the Kid Imposter Hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts. Alias Billy the Kid's autobiographical chapter, The Brushy Bill Story, relied mostly on semi-fictional, antiquated sources. Pat Garrett's 1882, The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, and Walter Noble Burns' 1926, The Saga of Billy the Kid, for Brushy Bill Roberts's fake memories. That left Brushy and his hoax team of mastermind William V. Morrison and book writer C.L. Sonnishin unaware of the Lincoln County War, the Regulators, and the freedom fight against the Santa Fe Ring. The real history is in Talks 15 and 16, linked below. In reality, the six-month Lincoln County War with its six-day culminating battle, was the pivotal event of real Billy's life. He dated its start in his March 13, 1879 letter to Governor Lew Wallace, writing, I have indictments against me for things that happened in the late Lincoln County War. That meant the April 1, 1878 regulator killings of Sheriff William Brady and Deputy George Hindman and the April 4, 1878 regulator killing of Brady's posse man, Andrew Buckshot Roberts. The reason was Tunstall's February 18, 1878 Santa Fe Ring assassination by these men and others in Brady's murder posse. As Billy knew, the war was deadly regulator skirmishes with ring-eyed John Kinney's gang and Seven Rivers boys with a final battle in Lincoln from July 14th to 19th under leadership of Alexander McSween. It ended in defeat of Billy's side by treasonous ring-eyed military intervention. In the dark, Brushy's version just parroted error-filled sources, confabulated to fill in gaps, and was posthumously fixed up by Sonishin and Morrison's forgeries. So, Brushy missed the Lincoln County War. His fiction just name-dropped for a so-called cattle feud. That Morrison prompted Brushy with this threadbare fakery is reflected in his December 3rd, 1953 speech titled Billy the Kid to the El Paso Rotary Club with his hoax partner, C.L. Sonishin, giving his introduction. Morrison stated, This private war was created by friction between the Murphy Dolan and Tunstall McSween Chisholm factions each of which was wresting trade from the other. 
Morrison's source was the saga of Billy the Kid, which called it, quote, an ugly cattle feud between A.G., actually L.G., Murphy, who had virtual lock on the cattle business in Lincoln County, and cattleman John Chisholm. Brushy and team added the ring merely as on the Murphy side, unaware that the war was a freedom fight against the ring. The inadequate prompt source was the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It stated, the principles in this difficulty were on one side John S. Chisholm, called the Cattle King of New Mexico, with Alexander A. McSween and John H. Tunstall as important allies. On the other side was the firm of Murphy and Dolan, merchants in Lincoln, the county seat, backed by nearly every small cattle owner in the Pecos Valley. This latter faction was supported by Thomas B. Catron, United States Attorney for the Territory, and a considerable cattle owner in the Pecos region. This bloody war originated about as follows. The smaller cattle owners in the Pecos Valley charged Chisholm with monopolizing as a right all this vast range of grazing country along the Pecos. So, Better Brushy, the Brushy Bill Story's narrator, fixed up by Sonishin from Dad Real Brushy's tape recordings by prompting Morrison, spoke with rehabilitated grammar of English teacher Sonishin. So Sonishin, pretending to be Brushy, stated, The Murphy Bunch had the backing of the Santa Fe Ring which included Tom Catron, U.S. District Attorney, and his brother-in-law. Of course, they were not out in the open with it, but during the Cattle War, old Tom took over the Murphy Dolan property. All the politicians belonged to the Santa Fe Ring, even judges and attorneys. After that, Brushy name-dropped the ring, merely to claim things were unfair in those days. The source for the ring was the 1927 edition of The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid's Note by Maurice Garland Fulton about Catron and the ring as involved in the conflict. The saga of Billy the Kid also stated that the Murphy side had, quote, the patronage of politicians and businessmen in Santa Fe. Then, Brushy tried his special knowledge trick. He called Alexander McSween John Tunstall's partner. This fatal error was from the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It stated, Tunstall had ample means at his command and formed a partnership with McSween at Lincoln and invested considerably in cattle. The saga of Billy the Kid copied, stating, Tunstall and McSween were soon close friends. When Tunstall proposed that they enter into a business partnership and open a general merchandise store in Lincoln, which he consented to finance in major part, McSween agreed with enthusiasm. In reality, the horrific injustice that precipitated the Lincoln County War was that Tunstall and McSween were not partners. That was the Santa Fe Ring's lie used by ring-eyed judge Warren Bristol in his February 4, 1878 hearing on McSween's embezzlement case to drag Tunstall into the ring's malicious prosecution of McSween. Faking a partnership let the ring attach Tunstall's as well as McSween's property to harass then murder Tunstall on February 18th with ring-eyed Sheriff Brady's posse. But knowing only a cattle conflict theme, Brushy confabulated that McSween had worked for Murphy to prosecute, quote, 
Chisholm's Cowboys for cattle rustling, but quit when he learned Chisholm was only taking back cattle Murphy rustled from him. That fable was built on the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It stated, McSween was a successful lawyer in Lincoln and was often retained by Chisholm. In reality, McSween quit as attorney because of Lawrence Murphy's and James Dolan's corruption, like selling rustled beef and mealy flour to the Mescalero Indian Reservation. To be noted is that Brushy and team didn't know that the Murphy Dolan store was known to all as the house. Brushy's fable continues with Tunstall's men being paid by Chisholm to steal back his cattle from Murphy, so, quote, each accused the other of cattle stealing. The source was the saga of Billy the Kid's fiction that John Chisholm employed McSween as an attorney to prosecute Murphy's cattle thieves. Brushy adds that the rings had Tom Catron took over the Murphy Dolan property during that cattle war. The prompt source was Maurice Garland Fulton's note in the 1927 edition of The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid. It stated, Catron furnished the money needed by Murphy and Dolan in their business, of course taking mortgages, which at the close of the war gave him possession of their store and its stock of goods. Brushy then had to face the Fritz life insurance policy litigation against McSween without sources. So he confabulated that Murphy disagreed with McSween's law fee and attached Tunstall's property because Tunstall was his partner. This error was lifted from the saga of Billy the Kid. It stated, Murphy had sworn out an attachment against the McSween Tunstall store with purpose to collect the old debt he alleged against Fritz. In reality, the embezzlement case against McSween was by Emil Fritz's brother and sister as his life insurance policies beneficiaries, not Murphy. The siblings were ring pawns used to entangle Tunstall. Real Billy was so enraged at the injustice to Tunstall that on February 10, 1878, he almost shot Brady's deputies doing the attachment at Tunstall's store. Next came the Lincoln County War's precipitant, John Tunstall's murder. But Brushy and team knew nothing. They were unaware of real Billy's eyewitness deposition about it to investigator Frank Warner Angel since it wasn't discovered until 1956. So Brushy makes the fatal error that he, as Billy, wasn't present at Tunstall's ambush. The source for the error was the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It stated, before night, the kid was appraised of his friend Tunstall's death. Brushy also made up that the murdering group was headed by so-called Billy Morton instead of Brady's actual chief deputy, Jacob Basil Billy Matthews, known to real Billy for harassing Tunstall's ranch hands including Billy, when attaching Tunstall's Felis River Ranch cattle. Note also Brushy's trick of faking familiarity. Here, changing William Morton's name to Billy when his actual nickname was Buck. The prompt source for the era was The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid. It stated, William S. Morton, said to have had authority as deputy sheriff with a posse of men composed of cowboys from the Rio Pecos, started out to attach some horses, which Tunstall and McSween claimed. 
Brushy added the fatal error that Tunstall was herding the horses to Lincoln to, quote, surrender them until the case was cleared up. In reality, Brushy and team missed the injustice of Brady's posse's attack, so outrageous that it triggered the regulator movement and the Lincoln County War. The horses, as Tunstall's proven sole property, were immune to the attachment. Tunstall was innocently transferring them from his Felis River Ranch to his corral in Lincoln. The transfer was simply used by Brady as an excuse to complete the ring's intended assassination, as real Billy knew and saw. And Brushy and team were unaware of the ring's terrorist mocking. The horse was shot dead also, and Tunstall's hat was put on its head. For the aftermath, Brushy makes up attending Tunstall's funeral as Billy, stating, We buried his body behind the Tunstall's store. The prompt source for the fatal errors of Billy being at the funeral and the wrong grave site were lifted from the saga Billy the Kid. It stated, they buried Tunstall back of the McSween store. Billy the Kid was in the little group that stood beside the grave as the body was returned to the earth. In reality, Billy was not at the funeral. It was Tunstall's, not McSween's store, and Tunstall's real burial site was property to the east of the store. Behind the store was just a corral. And Brushy and team missed the major events for real Billy. The day after Tunstall's assassination, he gave an affidavit to Justice of the Peace John Squire Wilson naming Tunstall's murderers and was deputized for their apprehension along with Tunstall employee Fred Wade. That resulted in ring-eyed Sheriff Brady shielding the murderers by illegally jailing Billy and Wade from February 20th to 23rd, 1878, to block their serving warrants. That's why Billy wasn't at Tunstall's funeral. He was in Lincoln's pit jail. Then, Brushy makes another fatal error, saying Billy simply sought revenge for, quote, this dirty deed. The prompt source was the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It stated, breathing vengeance, the kid had become a monomaniac on the subject of revenge for the death of Tunstall. The saga of Billy the Kid copied, stating, with the murder of the Englishman, the kid threw himself into the feud to avenge his friend's death. There seems no reason to attribute any other motive to him. In reality, Tunstall's martyrdom made Billy a political zealot, fighting the Santa Fe ring by his deposition on Tunstall's murder his pre-Lincoln County War Battle Regulator Manifesto accusing ringhead Thomas Benton Catron, his grand jury testimony against ring-eyed murderers of attorney Chapman, his court of inquiry testimony against Commander Dudley's Lincoln County War intervention, and his guerrilla rustling from ringites. Brushy then makes up Billy pursuing, quote, Billy Morton, the leader of the mob, and Baker. He adds that they'd been, quote, good pals of mine when he worked with them at Murphy's Cow Camp. This is Brushy's usual trick of name-dropping 
for confabulating because he was unaware that the leader was ring-eyed Sheriff Brady, not Morton, or that the killers were Brady's posse men, not a mob. Brushy was also unaware of the regulators and Billy's being deputized to arrest Tunstall's murderers. So Brushy didn't know that the regulators captured Buck Morton and Frank Baker with murder warrants and they're being fatally shot by all the regulators, not just Billy, was when fleeing arrest. And real Billy never worked at the Rings Pecos Cow Camp, nor were Buck Morton and Frank Baker his friends. Then, Brushy adds a huge fatal error. He states that after killing Morton and Baker, Billy returned to Lincoln by, quote, the North Road over the mountains. The prompt source was apparently Brushy's coaching tour of Lincoln by Morrison. Seeing the east to west Capitan Mountains look like a barrier north of the town, Brushy fantasized this absurd 10,000 foot crossing. In reality, the regulators, including Billy, like everyone else, used the military road around the Capitan's eastern end to get to Lincoln. The next big event, mangled by Brushy and team, was the Sheriff William Brady killing. Brushy, sticking to a cattle conflict, said, Sheriff Brady was gunning for me with warrants for cattle stealing. The source was Brushy's reworking the authentic life of Billy the Kid's era. Its fiction stated, Sheriff Brady held warrants for the kid and his associates, charging them with the murders of Morton, Baker, and Roberts. In reality, Andrew Buckshot Roberts was killed by the regulators after Brady. And the saga of Billy the Kid just repeated Garrett's fiction. It stated, Billy the Kid by whose hand Morton and Baker had died, was the special target of Sheriff Brady's wrath, so the sheriff sought personal vengeance against the kid. Brushy added, Brady had caught us at Seven Rivers a short time before he arrested us. He took my six-shooter, a forty-four single action, with pearl handles. A source footnote attributes the gun taking to George Coe's 1934 book, Frontier Fighter, but adds that Coe said it was a Winchester, which it was. In reality, deputized Billy had been illegally arrested by Brady and Lincoln, not Seven Rivers, before Tunstall's funeral with confiscation of his Winchester 73 carbine. Actually, Brushy and team had no idea why Brady was killed. The authentic life of Billy the Kid didn't help. It stated there was apparently no motive except that Brady harassed the kid and his followers. In reality, the motive of the anti-ring regulators, including Billy, for killing Brady that April 1st, 1878, was to save Alexander McSween from being murdered by him at his arrival later that day for his upcoming grand jury trial on the embezzlement case. Brady, having murdered Tunstall just 42 days earlier, was now heading with his three deputies to McSween's arrival point at the east of Lincoln. Brushy's fiction has Brady accompanied by a Hindman, no first name, and Billy Matthews called the county clerk. The prompt source for the Clerk Matthews era was the saga of Billy the Kid. It stated, 
Sheriff Brady, Deputy Sheriffs George Hinman and Dad Pepin, and Circuit Court Clerk Billy Matthews foregathered in the front of Murphy's store in Lincoln on the morning of April 1st, 1878. In reality, Billy Matthews was Brady's deputy, as real Billy stated in his deposition to investigator Frank Warner Angel about Tunstall's murder. Brushy adds that he was aiming for Matthews so shouldn't have been accused of Brady's murder. The source footnote is an alleged Pat Garrett statement to that effect from a 1936 quasi-fictional book by Miguel Otero titled The Real Billy the Kid. The saga of Billy the Kid also stated Billy was disappointed that he had failed to get Matthews. Knowing from George Coe's 1934 Frontier Fighter that Billy got a gun from Brady's corpse, Brushy faked it as a pearl-handled 44. And the saga of Billy the Kid stated, Billy took Brady's rifle and six-shooter, both new and brightly furbished. The authentic life of Billy the Kid merely stated that Billy and his fellows went out to steal guns. In reality, Billy retrieved his own Winchester 73 carbine, which Brady had confiscated in Billy's illegal arrest 40 days earlier. Picking up from sources only that an adobe wall was involved in Brady's shooting, Brushy name-dropped it by confabulating that Billy Matthews fired from behind an adobe wall to hit himself as Billy and Fred Waite, misspelled as W-A-Y-T-E, when they retrieved the gun. The prompt source for the era was the saga Billy the Kid. It stated, Billy and Waite, misspelled W-A-Y-T-E, vaulted over the wall and walked out into the road where Brady lay. Billy Matthews, from the Mexican house in which he had found refuge, opened fire. His first shot cut through the flesh of the kid's hip and wounded Wade in the thigh. In reality, Billy's companion was Jim Frenchy French, not Fred Wade, and the adobe wall was the street-facing side of Tunstall's store's corral, behind which the regulators hid for the ambush. Billy and French ran out through its gate to retrieve his carbine. Worse, the shooting Matthews era exposed a big fatal one by Brushy and team. They thought there'd been a gunfight. They didn't know that it was a regulator ambush of Brady and his deputies. They also missed the catastrophe of Matthews's shooting. French couldn't ride to escape with the regulators after the ambush. Town doctor Taylor Ely had to secretly extract French's thigh bullet with a poker. Billy then hid French under the floorboards in Tunstall's store until he could sneak him out of town. The next big event was Andrew Buckshot Roberts' killing. Brushy was stuck with the cattle war. He fabricated a backstory in which Buckshot argued with himself as Billy and Charlie Bowdry at his fictional house in San Patricio. The source for the made-up argument seems to be the saga Billy the Kid. It stated, Billy the Kid and Bowdry had a brush with Roberts in the neighborhood of San Patricio. Roberts is said to have fired on them without warning. In reality, Billy Matthews was the attacker, and Billy had no house in San Patricio, though he spent time there. The era's source was the authentic life of Billy the Kid, which called it a favorite resort for the kid. 
Brushy would also have seen San Patricio as the address used by Billy for his March 20th, 1879 pardon bargain letter to Lou Wallace. Brushy's bigger fatal error is that if he, as Billy, had a house there, he would not have missed the Ring's July 3rd, 1878 massacre of its residents by Ring-Eyed Sheriff George Pepin using John Kinney's Rustler gang as his posse that inspired Billy's Regulator Manifesto and the Lincoln County War Battle itself in 11 days. Brushy claimed that Buckshot shooting at them was, quote, the reason I was trying to kill him at Blazers for revenge. The prompt source for that era was The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid. It stated, Billy's hunger for vengeance was by no means satiated when the group led by Dick Brewer went to arrest Buckshot Roberts. The kid was as quick as his foe and his aim more accurate. The bullet from the rifle went crashing through Robert's body, inflicting a mortal wound. In reality, Buckshot Roberts' killing was part of the Lincoln County War. He was on Tunstall's murder posse and was resisting the deputized regulator's arrest at Dr. Joseph Blazer's office building at Blazer's Mill. Billy didn't fire at all. Buckshot was hit only by Charlie Bowdry and died of that abdominal wound the next day. Further missed by Brushy and team was Buckshot's carnage with his Winchester. Its bullet hit Bowdry's belt buckle, ricocheted, and maimed George Coe's hand. Another shot hit John Middleton in the chest. Buckshot's spree ended with murdering Dick Brewer. Brushy then said that Billy replaced Dick Brewer as leader. The prompt source for the era was the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It fabricated Billy as new leader, but unaware of the regulators, called the man a squad. It stated, with Brewer dead, the command of the squad by common consent was conferred upon the kid. In reality, John Chisholm's cattle detective, Frank McNabb, replaced Brewer as regulator leader. And after McNabb's murder by the ring, Hosiah Doc Skurlock was head. Billy never was the leader. The Lincoln County War battle gets a big, fake, flowery, sonishin plug for special knowledge. He wrote, The three-day battle in Lincoln, July 17, 18, and 19, 1878, was the end of the struggle for the McSween faction. It was a bloody business, and Brushy Bill Roberts described it as if every detail had been burned into his memory with a branding iron. The prompt sources for the three-day battle era were the authentic life of Billy the Kid's chapter, titled The Desperate Three Days Fight in Lincoln, and the saga of Billy the Kid's chapter, The Three-Day Battle. In reality, the battle was six days from July 14th through 19th, 1878. For know-nothing brushy, the battle was still a cattle war. In a fatal era, he was unaware that its immediate precipitant was Ringeyed Sheriff Pepin's July 3rd, 1878 San Patricio massacre to punish its Hispanic residents for backing the McSween side, resulting in the majority of the battle's fighters being Hispanic men from San Patricio and Picaccio. Instead, Brushy claimed the Murphy store stole cattle from Chisholm and 
We got them back from him. Brushy apparently thought the battle was caused by Chisholm's hiring Billy and others as mercenaries. Brushy stated that Chisholm promised to pay the men, quote, 500 apiece to fight for them. There were many prompt sources for the Chisholm fable. The authentic life of Billy the Kid stated, Billy and his companions said that Chisholm owed them $600 each for services rendered during the war. The saga Billy the Kid repeated the claim. Alias Billy the Kid's source footnote is a 1943 Frontier Times Magazine article titled A Story of Billy the Kid, reprinting an August 10, 1881 Laredo Times fiction titled Killing of Billy the Kid. It stated, after killing some of Chisholm's cowboys after the war, Billy said to one, I want you to live and take a message to old John Chisholm for me. Tell him during the Lincoln County War he proposed to pay me five dollars a day for fighting for him. I fought for him and never got a cent. Now I intend to kill his men wherever I meet them, giving him credit for five dollars every time I drop one. That article was, in turn, cribbed from Lou Wallace's June 18, 1881, Billy the Kid Outlaw Myth article in the Crawfordsville Saturday Evening Journal as Billy the Kid, General Wallace, tells why the young desperado of New Mexico wanted to kill him. It stated, Billy worked for John Chisholm, the cattle dealer in the late Lincoln County trouble, and claiming he has never received the promised five dollars per day for his services, he is hunting down and killing Chisholm's herdsmen and giving their employer credit for five dollars for each man killed. Then, Brushy had to describe the battle without sources to fake a first-person narrative. So, it's days before Fort Stan Commander and A.M. Dudley's intervention are absent. And Dudley's July 19, 1878 march on Lincoln is thin. Missing are Dudley's terrifying Gatling gun and howitzer cannon, which caused flight of McSween's men, except those besieged in his house, including Billy. Missing is that trapped in that house were also McSween's wife Susan, her sister, and her sister's five young children. Missing is the gunpowder keg that exploded after the house was set on fire by Pepin's posse men. Racist, hate-filled Brushy came up with, On the last day, Colonel Dudley rode into town with those N-word soldiers. He demanded that McSween stop the fighting. Then Brushy spouted the claim, hailed as a special knowledge clincher by the book's dupe publisher, E.B. Mann, and by Sonishin. Brushy said, Some of Dudley's N-word soldiers were up on the side of that hill firing on us with a Murphy man. The prompt source for black troops was the saga Billy the Kid. It stated two squadrons of Negro cavalry with Colonel Dudley in command were soon moving at double quick on the road to Lincoln. In reality, Dudley also brought white infantrymen and white officers with his black 9th Cavalry. Morrison inadvertently explained their lack of a source. It was too expensive to buy. 
on May 21st, 1955, after Alias Billy the Kid's publication, he wrote to historian Philip J. Rash, you say it wasn't so that the Negro soldiers were fighting with Pepin's men. Apparently, you have a copy of the Court of Inquiry proceeding. They quoted me around $100 for copy. That's about $1,000 today, which was too expensive for my use. I located other evidence to prove that Billy testified before court. Morrison apparently got a few possibly defective copy transcript pages to Coach Brushy. Years earlier, Morrison's March 24, 1951 letter to historian Robert N. Mullen proved that shooting black troops was his own error used to prompt Brushy. With his stilted legalese, Morrison wrote, Dudley was acquitted, but the fact remains that the testimony by Kidd and others was not rebutted on certain issues. Therefore, we considered it competent. Billy, meaning Brushy, told me that Negro soldiers under Colonel Dudley were fighting with Murphy men. The testimony in inquiry sets out that three Negro soldiers were firing with Murphy men against the McSween men. One can now trace Brushy's prompt error by that number three used for firing soldiers. Morrison had a transcript page with Billy's testimony about three firing soldiers, but it was missing his statement that they were white. Morrison extrapolated from the saga of Billy the Kid's claiming Negro cavalrymen to erroneously make the shooting soldiers black. So that's what Coach Brushy parroted with personal twist of his vicious racism. In reality, this is Billy's excerpted testimony on May 29, 1879, at the Dudley Court of Inquiry. Question, how many soldiers fired at you? Answer, three. Question, how many shots did those soldiers fire? Answer, I could not swear to that on account of the firing on all sides. I could not hear. I seen them fire one volley. Question, were the soldiers which you say fired at you as you escaped from the McSween house on the evening of July 19th last, colored or white? Answer, white troops. Close quote. Key is volley. That meant that three white soldiers fired in unison, requiring Dudley's order. That made Dudley responsible for firing to kill civilians. Morrison, therefore brushy, had missed the key firing by white troops. In fact, in a fair court, Billy could have gotten Dudley court-martialed for Posse Comitatus Act violation by ordering his likely officers to fire on civilians. The battle scene was also sparse because Brushy's confabulations were so glaringly wrong that Sonishin kept them out. An example is in a Morrison letter of April 14, 1951, to Robert N. Mullen, stating, The Murphy Store Building, note that Brushy was unaware of its nickname, the house, was the fortress from where the Murphy men fired on the McSween house. It was a very important landmark in Brushy's memory. Morrison's era came from the saga of Billy the Kid. It stated, came a crash of rifles from the Murphy clan shooting from the windows of the Murphy store and hotel. The balls thudded against the adobe walls of the McSween house and tore ragged holes 
through the window shutters. In reality, there was no firing from the house, which was not also a hotel. At the west end of town, it was far from McSween's house at its center. Sheriff Pepin's posse fired from the south foothills before attaining the advantage from Dudley's intervention on July 19th when they surrounded then burned McSween's house. Ignorant Sonishin did include Brushy's fiction that, quote, some of the Murphy men were just across the river which ran past the north of the house. That error came from the saga of Billy the Kid. It stated, James Dolan, Andy Boyle, Old Man Pierce, and Charlie Hall plunged down the embankment behind the hostelry, hidden from the road, went at a run across the bottoms of the Bonita. Up the embankment they scrambled in the rear of the McSween house to set it on fire. In reality, no attack was from the Bonito River. The key, as real Billy testified, is that Dudley left three soldiers on McSween's property to prevent firing, so Andy Boyle and others had free access to set fire to the defenseless house. To escape from the burning McSween house, Brushy cited the kitchen. The source was the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It stated, when night set in, the defenders of the house had but one tenable room left, the kitchen at the back of the house. The saga of Billy the Kid stated, one room remained, the kitchen, with the roof blazing over their heads, the kid and his man prepared for a dash for safety. With his usual name dropping, confabulation, and racism, Brushy said that when they escaped, Bob Beckwith and some of them N-words started to come in. In reality, Dudley's black cavalrymen weren't in the fighting. Brushy added that when Beckwith was entering the kitchen, he as Billy shot him dead. The source for that era was the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It stated, Robert W. Beckwith passed around the corner of the main building in full view of the kitchen doorway. The kid shot but once, and Beckwith fell dead. The saga of Billy the Kid stated, Fire poured from the muzzles of Billy's 44s. Bob Beckwith, slayer of McSween, fell dead across the wall. In reality, Sheriff George Pepin's posse man, Bob Beckwith, was killed by friendly fire after Alexander McSween's men, including Billy, had escaped. Beckwith was serving a warrant on cornered McSween, not killing him, when Pepin's posse men fired fatally at McSween and accidentally killed Beckwith too. To be noted is that historian Philip J. Rash later debunked alias Billy the Kid using Brushy's Billy Killing Beckwith era. So defensive Morrison responded to Rash with a double-talking fix-up letter on June 1, 1955, writing, Roberts did not believe that his shot killed Beckworth. He merely thought it did. Brushy then gave the order of people escaping the burning house. The prompt source, as revealed in Morrison's March 24, 1951 letter to Robert N. Mullen, was his page of the Court of Inquiry transcript. Morrison wrote, Billy, meaning Brushy, told me that he was the first man to leave the burning McSween building that night. The testimony in the Court of Inquiry definitely establishes the sequence with which the McSween men left the burning building. 
It states that Billy, accompanied by another man, left the same time with the other men following. Of course, historians would like for us to believe that Billy was the last man to leave the building. In reality, that page of Billy's May 28, 1879 testimony stated, question, who escaped from the house with you and who was killed at the time, if you know, while attempting to make their escape? Answer, Jose Chavez y Chavez escaped with me. Note that Brushy used this for, quote, accompanied by another man. Vincente Romero, Francisco Zamora, and McSween. But Morrison, therefore coached Brushy, mistook Billy's list of names as the order of escaping because Morrison lacked the rest of Billy's testimony transcript. It stated, question, explain whether all the men that were in the McSween house came out at the same time. Answer, all came out at the same time. Brushy added, Chavez and I ran toward Tunsil's store, was fired at, and then turned toward the river. The parroted prompt source was Billy's May 28, 1879 Dudley Court of Inquiry testimony about the escape route. Billy said, ran towards the Tunsil store, was fired at, and there turned towards the river. Racist Brushy concluded, If we could have kept them N-words out there at Stanton, we would have whipped Pepin's posse. In reality, non-racist Billy would have correctly blamed Dudley, not his cavalrymen. That's why Billy risked his life to testify against Dudley to get him court-martialed. And Billy would have known that, like himself, Dudley's Black Ninth Cavalrymen, Private James Bush and Sergeant Houston Lusk, on May 30th and 31st, right after Billy's own testimony, had risked their lives to testify against Dudley for ordering them treasonously to guard Sheriff Pepin to stop McSween's defenders from shooting as Pepin walked through town for fear of hitting a soldier and getting retaliative fire from Dudley's Gatling gun and howitzer. This tactic enabled Pepin's posse men to set fire to McSween's house and win the war. So, Brushy Bill's autobiography as Billy the Kid, covering the Lincoln County War period, had no special knowledge, parroted sources, confabulations, fatal errors, and fatal ignorance, all proving he wasn't Billy Bonney. And it showed the hoaxer's labor to trick readers. The talk to follow will debunk the Brushy Bill stories faked Governor Lou Wallace pardon bargain with Billy Bonney in Alias Billy the Kid. <laughs>